that well already already uh, mentioned that we plan to transfer the notion of AI literacy to primary and secondary education and we aim to introduce students to the core principles of AI and machine learning uh, through games. Uh, a set of games that we call game-based educational toolbox that there are games that or playful activities that already exist over the web that they're frequently used by teachers or plan, we plan to introduce them to teachers in addition to games that we make uh, here at the Institute uh, and uh, at the National Technical University of Athens in, in collaboration. The objectives of the project is first to design a framework within artificial intelligence and machine learning that sits within the primary and secondary educational context. And we have designed that. We are in the, in the phase of a project that we actually have that. Based on that, implement innovative toolbox that features a set of games and playful activities that realizes the scenarios of machine learning and AI training and uh, using those games to produce a relevant uh, teaching and learning material for, for students and teachers. And obviously, we need to be able to educate teachers to actually use that toolbox and train teachers and promote creative reflection on AI ethics. So the, et the ethical part of the project is really big uh, once we have the, the, the games in place. Uh, further, students should be trained in uh, all these various forms of data biasing, gender biasing uh, that are often, um, often existent within uh, AI uh, algorithms. And obviously the societal application implications of all that. Finally, we will involve students in, in two years time in all these courses so that they become AI literate and responsible uh, citizens with regards to ethics and trends of AI. Um, I'd, I'd just like to show you one very early prototype of what we were trying to achieve, like an, an, the idea of training um, students of primary school within the principles, let's say, of supervised learning or else imitation learning, where you have you know, an early version of Minecraft here and the student is, is selecting how much time uh, he or she wants to train a neural network and the size of a neural network. And then it trains this artificial neural network and then it tests it so that this agent in Minecraft, um, you know, does pathfinding basically, realizes pathfinding, goes from A to B. And uh, the, the student soon realizes that if, if the parameters are not selected, if the brain is too small, of the if the neural network is too small, it won't be able to learn it. If you don't give enough time, uh, the neural network won't be able to learn it. But uh, if, you give, if you give to the system a larger brain, more time, then it will be able to accomplish more uh, difficult tasks. This is just one of the games that we are creating uh, or scenarios that we are sort of prototyping with. We are really far away from delivering the toolbox, but it's again, it's the first six, eight months of the project. We had issues with COVID, of course. So by next year, I will be able to, to, to tell you more and give you more details. So if you like the idea of using games to teach artificial intelligence uh, on the primary and secondary school levels, you, you are welcome to like us, follow us, and so on, connect with the community. Um, you can check out the games that already exist and uh, the documents that we have uh, produced so far. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. So I'm going back to your own. And if there are any questions, obviously I'm here to to take them. Sure. Um, has Mihailis managed to join? Uh, I, th I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Nice. Uh, I had to change two machines. That's why it took me some time. I don't, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I don't know what happened. And now this machine doesn't have a camera, but I guess we can live with that. Uh, sure. Um, should I start? Uh, with, um, uh, yes, Michalis uh, from NTNU in Trondheim in Norway will be presenting the Common Play project, um, which focuses on science learning through um, um, uh, playful activities outside school, so in informal and non formal settings. So yeah, the stage is yours, Michalis. Uh, nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ciro. Um, so one of the main challenges when young um, uh, students learn about science 
uh, is the fact that it's a little bit boring. It's not that much creative, much it's creative and a lot of students find that this is not what they would like to do for the rest of their life. So uh, this is a project that uh, the main idea when we started working with that is to uh, leverage on ways in informal learning context in uh, making and playing uh, activities where students can engage with uh, learning science in a fun and creative way. Um, so just a little bit of uh, admin information, Common Play in Science uh, project uh, is uh, SWAFS, is a Science with and for Society Horizon project. It's a research and innovation action that uh, started approximately two years ago and has approximately uh, a year that uh, has been left. And uh, there are uh, 11 partners from 10 different European countries, uh, besides the uh, big universities like uh, NTNU, uh, Uppsala, uh, TU Munich, University of Malta, and so on and so forth. There is also a uh, design for change organization, uh, uh, the Science Museum of London, and uh, companies. Uh, and we also have OVOS as a company and FORTH as a research center. Uh, so the main the main goal of the project is to help Europe better understand new ways, different ways, more creative ways that non-formal and informal science learning can take place. And the way we're doing it is by leveraging on three pillars: uh, coding, making, and play activities. That we have seen some good potential. We have seen that those three pillars uh, work well in some activities, but what are the lessons we can learn and how we can leverage on, on those successes in order to um, make science more accessible to young uh, students. Uh, the project has six objectives. And first of all, uh, we're working, we have, we have finished, the we have worked with the first objective, which is to develop an appropriate conceptual and methodological framework that integrates all aspects of the uh, project into a unifying conceptual map. So that was the substrate of the, of the project that allowed us to uh, work with the next uh, objectives. We obviously work with the European wide community of state stakeholders. That's uh, the main idea behind having partners from 10 different European countries. So we're working towards uh, setting up a European wide community that has stakeholders like learners, educators, uh, facilitators, and policy makers from diverse fields that contribute towards uh, guiding, helping, and uh, assessing the the conducted research. Uh, one of the main objectives that we have been working uh, with uh, during the last uh, years is to identify, pool, and analyze practices. So best practices, we have seen that uh, uh, they, they're working pretty well in uh, science museums, in uh, uh, workshops, in formal learning workshops, in uh, other activities. When it comes to making and play-based practices, were leveraged and were uh, used to construct a, a set of best practices. We surveyed uh, approximately 200 experts across Europe. Another objective is, and this is the phase we're right now, is conducting in-depth learner-centered participatory and empirical research on those selected practices. So to see how those practices are used and what are the important details, what are the lessons we can learn from putting them into practice and how we can help, we can help different contexts to uh, have these uh, su successes, let's say, to have these um, good working results. Uh, the next step is to, and we we have started working a little bit with a study on the on the impact of uh, on education and society, but uh, this is something we're working uh, more, and we will be working more during the last year of the project. So we are analyzing the empirical data we have been collecting 
uh, in order to develop, uh, to, to identify the impact and also to build um, some kind of a roadmap, if I can say, if I can put it that way. Uh, we, of course, uh, the project focuses a lot on disseminating and communicating the results. So that's why we have uh, developed uh, an app and uh, we're, we're, we're trying to form a community around Common Play. I will give you some useful links at the end that you, you can, uh, if you want, you can subscribe. And also, besides uh, those six, besides those six objectives, we also have six main results. Um, the first of all is an online inventory of practices that you can access uh, in uh, Common Play um, in um, our website in commonplay.eu, where uh, you can access practices from experts, but also it allows you to upload your own practices. So you can go and upload uh, the practice. And of course, there is a process for assessing and registering the practice online. But um, that's, that's something we, we have pipeline. There is a way of doing it. And we're hoping that we will collect a lot of practices from experts throughout Europe so we can further this inventory. Um, so there is also in, and you can find, you can access this on uh, commonplayscience.eu as well. There is a good um, amount of methods and tools that we have developed and we're putting into practice now in our case studies, both for community building, but also uh, methods and tools that can help you to assess your uh, informal science uh, learning activities. There is also a web-based and I would say mobile-based uh, game that you can uh, utilize that we have uh, made available and we're working on improving, collecting data and improving it. And this uh, is something uh, you again, you can find on the website. And in the future, we're hoping to form the collected data uh, as a, a knowledge kit, but also as a roadmap for Europe. That's the objective we have for the last year to develop a roadmap that will allow uh, stake different stakeholders and institutes in Europe to leverage on the lessons learned and apply those empirically tested practices. Uh, again, the sixth, uh, the last uh, result we have, which is uh, at stake at that point, is uh, disseminating and communicating the results of the project through various public events and training activities. Uh, we have organized several of those activities, but uh, the truth is, sorry, the truth is that um, we had to cancel some of the uh, events, uh, especially during the last, um, uh, the last year. We don't know how many of the events we will be able to, to have. But uh, that's something we're working on. We're, 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 we will find out how we can um, run those events probably virtually. Um, and of course, what you can, you can engage, you can find all the information that are available on uh, commonplayscience.eu, uh, but also you can subscribe on uh, commonplayscience.eu slash community and we're really we're really looking forward to your contribution the main the main idea is to offer the platform common play science will offer the platform the substrate needed but then it's up to the various stakeholders to participate and make this platform to enrich the platform and make it useful for uh, people who uh, want to develop informal science learning activities and i think that's Pretty much, yes, that's pretty much all I, I wanted to share with you. And I, I'd love if you have any questions or you would like to discuss it uh, afterwards, it, it would be really, really nice. I think you, I think you can stop sharing your screen now, yeah. Thais. Perfect. So if you have any questions, please use the raise hand button. until our uh, next presenter is ready. Any questions? 
So our next presenter is, um, I think it will be Julio, Julio Barbera, if yeah. I'm correct. Barbera, yeah. Barbera. And um, he will be presenting, he will be discussing um, how digital games can support computational thinking. Yes. Well, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me share my screen. So, okay, I hope you can hear me and you can see my screen. Good. So, okay, um, my colleagues and I, we work at the Department of Computer Science of Leiden University. So our main focus uh, in research is to see, it's in, in particular programming education, and in particular to see how video games could be used to train computational thinking skills. Uh, during the background research we did, uh, we came up with this, this more of a proposal for a new point of view that uh, could help the experimental research in the field. Uh, the current experimental research that we have found it can be distinguished mainly in two categories. One is a general approach, and this general approach involves uh, going to look for gaming habits in the participants and then uh, involving the participants in uh, uh, programming education courses or classes and then testing computational skills after trying to relay them to the gaming habits. And the other is a particular approach instead that tends to develop their own video games to actually test computational thinking skills. Now, both these approaches brought very good results. Uh, they also have some shortcomings. So the first one, of course, when we go to talk in general of gaming habits, immediately we have the questions, what kind of games? Like there must be a difference between, I don't know, soccer games and RPGs or strategy games. And the, the particular approach instead tends maybe to have a difficulty in the end where there is a gap between your video game, the one you created for this experiment and the reality of all the video games that are out there that are not created with this goal. So this is where our proposal comes in. We wanted to see if it uh, uh, was uh, possible to actually try to relate game components and individual game components to individual computational thinking skills. Now, immediately, if we talk about these two, we need to also say we, what do we mean with game components and also computational thinking skill set. In the first case, we decided to use the game design patterns by Bjork and Olopainen. Um, this is for us, specifically, the first advantage is that we use design patterns in computer science. So it is easy to, to communicate. Um, and also it allows pretty well to deconstruct video games in several components. As for the computational thinking skill set, we decided to do a pretty standard choice. We went for the skill set of Casimogro et Ali and uh, that involves these uh, five main components. And the main advantages of this is that it's well-defined, it's easy to understand, and also it has a pretty good coverage, both theoretic in theory and in practice of what involves uh, computational thinking, in particular in programming. Um, so what we're, I'm gonna do in this presentation, I'm gonna propose three uh, examples of computational thinking skills, and I'm gonna show you some patterns that we uh, spotted could be related to them. So the first one is conditional logic. Conditional logic is the sequence of true and false values, how they control the flow of the statements, and it involves in particular uh, going to evaluate the status of the system at this specific point, trying to understand also what happened, the transformation in the data that happened before. Uh, the patterns that we found could be related were, first of all, the varied gameplay. This is, uh, well, it's very common, for example, in RPGs. The best example is Skyrim. Every single choice could change how the rest of the gameplay is gonna be. And so this automatically uh, involves also that when the player is in a choosing point, it has to actually be aware of the status of the game before and then try to make a choice uh, according to, well, what is their goals. Uh, the other pattern that we found very similar is incompatible goals. Incompatible goals, it has already a binary kind of nature that it's very close to the conditional logic. 
and uh, pursuing certain objectives basically excludes pursuing others. So this somehow even uh, exacerbate the previous pattern, trying to basically making it even more important to make a choice. The other um, computational thinking skill that I'm bringing here is building algorithms. So it's very similar, this one, to conditional logic, but it has a very different uh, uh, perspective because this involves more of an overview, both about the past and the future actions at every step. So it involves being aware of the network of functions or transformations that happen throughout the code. Um, so what we try to connect it here is to the producer consumer pattern. This is a very quite common pattern, in particular in Forex games or strategy games. Uh, each resource is, used, is produced somehow, consumed to produce new resources. And whenever you need to change this accordingly to achieve a certain result, you are going to have to be aware of the overview, exactly very similarly to how you build an algorithm to be able to actually uh, modify where needed this network. Um, the third and last computational thinking skill is simulation. So simulation is the creation of mental physical models that help you to uh, already define how do you are you gonna implement an algorithm and what is going to happen. Um, and it requires a lot of experimentation. Indeed, in the paper, you're gonna see that we also have experimentation as a pattern in this. The main pattern I bring here is uh, save and load cycles, which is very common in, also again in many video games. I bring the example of Final Fantasy because if you ever played, whenever you have a saving point, you know that immediately after there is going to be a very challenging battle. So players are allowed to try these battles, probably fail, then load it again and try with maybe different settings so they can simulate and test their simulations constantly. Now, um, in the conclusion, this is a proposal, of course, for a different approach in this experimental studies. And uh, um, it involves exactly analyzing each component individually, but being a proposal needs to be tested. And to test it, it needs to be, of course, played in an experimental study. Uh, I personally analyze two main possible approaches. One is to go multimedia, a multimedia approach. So we pick one specific component, one specific design pattern, and uh, we try to, to see the presence of this red design pattern throughout uh, different media, possibly some media that are already involved in education, that would be the best. And then we can check with the participants of the test different, how these different media and how this component in these different media can uh, uh, influence the results. The other one, it's again a more general approach. So we design a game in which it is possible to tune these uh, several patterns uh, differently, and then we can check how different settings of these patterns can bring different uh, results. So with this, I thank you for listening, and uh, I'm here to answer any question you might have. And these are the references and the games we use for this presentation. Thank you very much, Julio. Um, do you have any questions? If you can please um, raise your hands. Maybe I can start with a question. Um, I thought it was very, it was a great presentation, a very interesting, uh, very interesting topic, very interesting area. It could be um, uh, a foundation for uh, examining uh, learning computational thinking skills um, through games. Um, I was wondering about um, uh, the, the methodological approach you used. How did you go about it methodologically? I mean, did you have different uh, um, let's say coders going through the games, identifying patterns and saying, okay, this mechanic, this, this, uh, this game feature um, is linked to um, conditional logic. And then you, um, you compared uh, um, the, the, the codings of, of the raters. Did you check for um, inter-rater reliability or something like that? So how did you go about it? Yeah, well, it depended also a lot on the pattern, of course. Uh, you made a good example. In conditional logic, it was actually easier because uh, many times you can see that the conditional logic is implemented through uh, 
uh, if statements. So there is an immediate connection there, right? Um, and then it's implement of if statement also in video games when we do the variety gameplay. If something, if it, these choices been picked, if else, if else, if etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for others, it is more an initial approach in which we try to see commonalities on a more definition level. So, like if we go, for example, uh, simulation, that is already more difficult, right? Because that doesn't involve even the computational thinking skills doesn't involve a lot of coding. It's more of a mental exercise. Mm -hmm. So depends a lot on the, on the computational thinking skills we're, we're talking about, but it's a mixture of these two mainly. Okay. okay great, thanks. Um, just checking to see if there are any questions. So if there are no questions, um, we could go to our uh, next presentation um, on open and cultural data games for learning. Uh, the paper will be presented by Domna Hyotaki, I think. Is Domna here? Yes, yes, I'm here. Hi, Domna. Hello. Uh, can you tell yeah. me if... Uh, you can see the presentation? Yes, yes we can. Okay, great. Uh, so hello, I'm Domna and with Kostas, who was my thesis supervisor, we present to you an open and cultural data game for learning. Uh, first, let me tell you something about the game-based learning method. We use the game-based learning method in our research because of its relevance to the 21st century skills. Moreover, in the game-based learning, you can fail with safety uh, because uh, you can fail with safety without any real cost. Also, it assists self-reflection and critical thinking, increases determination, promotes creativity and cooperation, provides feedback in real time, and last but not least, increases self-evaluation. So the game we used uh, is the top drums, which uh, we adjusted for our research. Uh, here is the identity of the game. The subject of the game derived from the environmental education. The players were two to five. The duration of each game was five to 50 uh, minutes. And the age of the players, uh, which were the students uh, that they took part in our research, was seven years old. Each card was for a mammal. The goals uh, that we wanted to achieve through these lessons are identifying different mammals, understanding of the conversation status and of uh, measurable uh, concepts such as speed and size. And lastly, we wanted the students to acquire both hard skills such as comparing and ranking measurable concepts and soft skills such as cooperation, taking interest in environmental issues. Here you can see the cards as they were adjusting according to our subject. The different colors are, uh, are indicative of uh, carnivore, omnivore, and herbivore animals. In the rows, we used uh, four elements, max speed, max length, max weight, and life duration. The fifth row demonstrates conservation status. This status indicates whether the group still exists and how likely the group is to become extinct in the near future. The last row includes some basic information for the animals. So in this slide, you can see the four research questions. The first is investigate whether a top trans game can help achieve the learning goals of an environmental education course. The second, examine whether the effect of the game varies, varies with respect to performance. Study the effects of the game to students' interest in the course and its curriculum. And the last, investigate any gender-related differences in performance before and after using the game. Um, so, in, the in this research, we use three groups. The experimental group is the one that used the game. In the first control group, we used conventional teaching supported with multimedia technologies. To be specific, we used uh, Prezi presentations, presentation, one part of which uh, you can see on the picture. In the second group, we used conventional teaching. And the sample of, the, of, this, research, of this research consisted of uh, 60 students. 
the measurement instruments we used uh, were two questionnaires. The first was given to the students before and after the lesson and was our pre and post test in order to measure their performance related to the content of the course. The second questionnaire was about the game and measures how the game affected participation in class and if it enriched the students' general knowledge about environmental issues. The last part of this test derived from the IMI, Intrinsic Motivation Inventory, and investigates students' motivation by measure of fun and interest, perception, ability, and lack of uh, anxiety or stress. Uh, in this slide, you can see the results of the pre and post tests. The difference in the test, almost 28%, uh, in the experimental group leads to the conclusion that the game was effective as far as the knowledge that the students should gain through the lesson is concerned. Also, in these tables, you can see the increase in the knowledge of the students regarding the conservation status and their dietary habits. Some results of the research is that the 80% of the students reported that they felt less stressed during playing the game or during the post-test. 95% of the students reported that they were interested in the game and had fun. 80% of the students felt no stress and 60% stated that their perception ability was increased. Uh, to conclude, our experiment and the subsequent statistical analysis show that game-based learning has a positive statistically significant effect on academic performance in the specific field and had more impact than conventional teaching and teaching assisted by digital media. This positive effect was the same across all groups of students with respect to their performance. An interesting fact was that high-performing students did not benefit as much from conventional teaching, a fact that may be attributed to the relevant lack of interest shown by students for this paradigm. We didn't find any statistically significant gender-related differences in game adoption and benefit from the game. Since almost all students showed great or increased interest for the game, we weren't able to investigate any relation between the interest they showed and how well they did in the post-test. Lack of anxiety was positively correlated with increased performance, a fact that also vouches for the introduction of more game-based link sessions in the traditional curriculum. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Domna, for your presentation. Um, any questions? Uh, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand button somewhere on your uh, on your right. I think that ah, Rihanna. Yes, Rihanna. Sorry. Hi. Sorry, I couldn't find the button. Uh, I wanted to ask initially, why did you choose to uh, differentiate between the gender? Uh, what was your original question with that? Um, okay, uh, we would like to check if there's a difference in the game uh, between how uh, how interesting they will find uh, they will find it by how how interesting will be this game for boys or for girls? If there will be any difference, because we know that some uh, games we thought that is for uh, the boys and some uh, games we think that is for the girls. Uh, but uh, this game shows, uh, shows that there's no difference, uh, that uh, um, no matter the gender, um, the students, uh, they like the same the game, uh, they find it uh, less stressful than learning uh, with conventional and teaching. Okay, thank you. That's a nice result, actually. Nice. <laughs> I'm sorry, Domna. Maybe I've missed it. I've missed it. Maybe you mentioned it. Um, 
was it a game you developed yourselves or was it a, a game you selected for, for some reason to use? The game you used? If, if, if the games it was selected for some reason or for? Or, or was it a game developed by you? Was uh, it a, an existing game or did you develop it? The Tom Traps is a famous game. Uh, Yes, uh, but uh, it's an open data game that you can use it uh, with change the subject. You can use it uh, with uh, cities, uh, with countries and cities. You can use it uh, with uh, uh, the planets. Uh, you can use it many other subjects, uh, but you have to adjust it. Mm -hmm. hey, can I ask something? Uh... In, in your opinion, do you think that the, um, the gamification elements of this game uh, contributed to the results? And if there are things that uh, the game, if the game would have been developed differently, things uh, might have been slightly different, like uh, having badges or having, for instance, uh, other uh, gamification elements. Okay, I will tell you my opinion, but I would like it also Konstantinos Karpuzis, uh, that is more experienced to answer this question. Uh, first, I have to tell you that Tom Trab is an exist game, so uh, I didn't uh, adjust the elements of this game. Uh, it was the same, so there's no badges. We follow the rules, uh, for example. Um, but it's a, nice, it's a nice idea if we can add more uh, rules uh, in order to have badges, for example, or uh, adjust it uh, in something other form. I don't know if Costadinos <laughs> wants yeah. to add something. Yeah, thank you, Domna. Uh, actually, uh, the way Tom Trumps is played is like this. Each player um, has a set of cards you showed uh, Dom uh, its car uh, consists of the picture or of the animal and some measurable characteristics. So uh, each player gets to compare one of those characteristics with the the number, the relevant number in the card of uh, his op opponent. So whoever has the the best measurement uh, with respect to that characteristic wins, wins the card. So actually this enforces sort of a ranking mechanism, uh, which proved to be very helpful for the children to identify the relative sizes, the, the speed of each animal, and what was more important for us, the conservation status. So actually we wanted to exploit that ranking mechanism that uh, Top Trumps is done. And this was, I think, the, the, the most important outcome that uh, the children that were uh, part of the other control groups, the conventional uh, teaching and the Prezi teaching, uh, weren't able to grasp so much, especially the conservation status, because they couldn't compare different animals with respect to that component. So that's actually something that you can use uh, top trumps to, to teach students. If you want to teach relative measurements, as Domna said, for instance, the size of uh, different countries, uh, population, and so on. Great, thanks. Um, if there are uh, no more questions, um, I will be doing the next presentation. Um, I'll try to be, we're a bit uh, behind schedule, so I'll try to be really quick. Um, okay, I hope you can see the presentation. So I'll be presenting um, a study we did at uh, um, the University of Athens, the Department of Early Childhood Education. Um, Sorry. So um, our focus in this study was uh, was a study a participatory game design session involving preschool children. Um, certainly, our focus was not on the development of a fully functional digital game, 
but rather on the on the process and the perceptions and the attitudes of the children. Uh, we're trying to see whether children of preschool age would be able to express, conceptualize, and model their ideas. And we try to, um, to provide insights and guidelines for game designers, researchers, and possibly educators for the development of appropriate protocols for participatory game design, uh, participatory game design, design with preschool children. Uh, so, first of all, what uh, why participatory game design and what is participatory design? Um, previous studies over the past approximately 20 years have shown that involving children in the design of, uh, of a new technology. Iro, sorry to interrupt, but your screen doesn't really show, I don't think. Uh, oh, there we go. Now it's better immediately. Good, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I should uh, make it full screen. So, can you see it now? Or yes, we can see it now. Experiment a little bit. Give me a second. You can see it now. You see it? Is there it okay? is for me a gray square in the middle. Uh, now it's on a side. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry about this. Um, so, uh, why participate in uh, game design? Um, research over the past 20 years has shown that when uh, we involve children in the process of the design of, uh, of a technological environment, um, not as end users, not as testers, not as informants, but as uh, equal design partners, uh, we get valuable insights, we get creative and unconventional ideas, um, and we can better address the needs and requirements of our target group. Uh, such activities are also very um, beneficial for the children. They, it is a very effective collaborative learning activity, participatory design. Um, they can express their identities, their perceptions, uh, they advance their game design skills, their problem-posing skills, they grow their confidence uh, on their role and their agency, on the design of technological uh, environments, they develop critical thinking and they feel in the, to be in the position to, to question design choices uh, of a, a technological environment and identify, identify potential uh, hidden bias uh, or uh, pre-assumptions. So they develop their digital literacy skills as well. So, but if we want to do such sessions, participatory game design sessions with children, and particularly with preschool children, there are quite a lot, a lot of challenges. Uh, children cannot uh, always uh, express uh, their conceptions. They lack the terminology or the conceptual understanding. So over the past years, there have been a number of frameworks uh, proposed for scaffolding uh, those partic such participatory um, design sessions and participatory game design sessions with children. Um, most of them use low-tech prototyping tools or um, half-made uh, games where the students can build on them. And um, we are actually uh, we are using for our study the Moser et al. Um, framework they used in their workshops around the world, uh, which uses low-tech prototyping tools for the children to develop uh, design games. Uh, but there is limited research and workshops and practices of uh, um, participatory game design uh, with preschool preschool children. Most of the studies uh, are done with children over the age of seven. So our study was part uh, of a larger project, school project, which took place at, uh, at the kinder kindergarten in Athens. Uh, the whole project, the title was Drafts Architecture Goes to School, uh, aimed at promoting the architectural, architectural perception of children, 
um, let them interact with the surrounding space. So there, there were uh, a number of activities uh, in the kindergarten during the school year, such as field trips, the children would go out to their neighborhood and take photographs, or interviews with uh, inhabitants, of inhabitants of specific historical buildings. They created models. So among these activities, it, uh, there was, uh, it was our uh, game design activity. Um, the children were asked to design a game based on their experiences during the whole project. So they were asked to design a game about their neighborhood so that the players could uh, find out more about the things the children themselves had learned during this project. So um, we had to do this activity, the game design activity, during the end of the school year. Uh, because um, we wanted them to have developed their cognitive, social and communication skills and also we wanted them to have completed the project on architecture. Um, we did the, the first study with the pilot study with two girls and one boy. Initially it was three girls and one boy but one of the girls left. Uh, then we went back and revised the protocol and I will talk about these revisions briefly later. We went back to the same kindergarten again, but with a different group of children. So what we collected, first of all, we collected data to analyze. So we recorded, we video recorded, audio, audio recorded everything, and we took uh, field notes as well. And then we collected material for actually developing the game, because we wanted for the children to see what they developed. So for the game, for the game prototype, and this is actually a screenshot uh, of, of the uh, final game, we use the audio recordings of the children narrating what happens in the game. We use the drawings of the children. We use photographs they had taken during the project. Uh, and then uh, we made a design document and we gave it to a game developer who developed the game based on the design document. Um, so, for analyzing uh, our data, mainly our recordings and notes, we used an in vivo approach. So, we're based on the data and try to find out what uh, phenomena, what uh, issues emerged. First, regarding our protocol, the process, and then the, the let's say, behavior or other the perceptions and conceptualization of the children. Um, so, observations, first of all, on the session protocol. Uh, we made observations, and I'll try to be really quick. Uh, if you have any questions later, please let me know. The group size for children was the optimal, uh, the optimum size. More children would be very hard to coordinate, for us to coordinate them, and for the children to collaborate uh, with each other. Um, many often uh, the children would require would require one to one support from us. They would ask questions, maybe simultaneously sometimes. So we had to support them one by one. So first the group size, then um, recalling previous game experience. Um, in our pilot session, it seemed uh, intuitive for us to ask them to first ask them if they have played any games, what games did they like. But we found out that uh, if we ask this question, the, the games they had talked about would influence their ideas later. So if a child uh, uh, talked about a racing game, all the, their ideas later would be uh, about uh, racing games. So uh, what we did uh, uh, on the main study, the second session, let's say, we reminded them of, of their field trip. We reminded them of, their, uh, uh, of uh, all the activities they had done about their neighborhood. Um, initially, based on our first protocol, uh, we wanted to use various materials like plasticine or Lego blocks so that children could develop an actual prototype of their game, a physical prototype. But this was not logistically possible eventually because children got tired, they lost interest, and they gave up. So what we did for the second session was, in the first stage, children would uh, describe their ideas. And the second stage, children would um, 
draw a storyboard. Sorry. Um, so the generation of ideas. Even this uh, two-stage uh, process had some shortcomings. During the idea generation stage, children started getting bored or uh, forget previously decided. Um, it was sometimes difficult to express their ideas um, and especially express ideas that were relevant to what they had before. Initially, decision making and turn taking. Uh, it was difficult uh, to, initially we thought maybe we should ask the children to decide which idea is best for the next scene of the game. But this was not possible because they could not decide. So in the pilot session, we ended with three different games. So for the, for the second session, we decided to take a more turn-taking approach, just in the rapid pace. Um, during the drawing and representation stage, we had to constantly encourage them and remind them of what uh, was decided. Um, <coughs> Um, now concerning the game narrative, um, children seem to have more experience with the narrative component. They were more familiar with it. We had to scaffold them, of course, um, but they gave some interesting uh, ideas. Um, the game mechanics, concerning the game mechanics, when we asked the children about their, uh, the game, rather when the children talked about their favorite games, the first thing they would recall were the actions. Uh, in the game, in my game, I do this, I drive a car, I do that. But it was difficult for them to describe the player actions and the mechanics for their game. And maybe this was probably expected. Um, um, we all, again, we had to scaffold them and ask them questions so as to be able to express. But uh, eventually they gave, they gave, again, some interesting ideas and they actually managed to distinguish between the player actions and the game mechanics, the hero actions. For example, one of the girls said, when the player wants, they will press the button um, and they will end the game. And this is actually one of the drawings of the children uh, with one of the challenges of the game where the, the heroes have to jump on the stones and the players will have to, uh, to touch the stones and make the heroes uh, jump through the stones. Um, so, uh, to sum up, there were a few challenges. Uh, it was difficult for the children to uh, discuss abstractly about their, their game design. It was difficult to focus at times. It was uh, difficult to uh, represent complex ideas for them. Uh, they were eager to make something, to make a physical artifact. Um, what we did was um, constant encouragement, small teams, fast-paced activity. <coughs> uh, there is a lot of potential of this uh, of, uh, participatory game design, but there is a need, to, uh, there is a need to support uh, and structure such, such uh, sessions. Um, maybe a solution would be a platform that allowed the children to easily represent, share and review their ideas and guide them through basic concepts of game design, like the mechanics, the heroes, the player actions, and also allow them to freely express their uh, creativity. Thank you very much. Try to be very, very brief. Any questions? Before we go to our break, we are 10 minutes behind, I think. If uh, there are no more questions, there are no questions, uh, we'll have a short break and maybe be back in uh, 10 minutes. Is that okay with you? Perfect. Thank you. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
Well, hello again for those of you who are back. Um, actually, uh, we have two more presentations before going to our uh, discussion, probably. Um, and then we have the workshop activity, which will be run by Dimitris Ramenos. So um, I'm afraid the next presentation will also be made by me, will be done by me, so you'll have to bear bear with me a bit longer. I'll try to be very quick again. Um, I'll present a study uh, done in Greece. Um, okay. All right, hopefully we can see this. So, um, our goal was to examine uh, the perceptions and attitudes of student teachers towards games. Um, well, uh, previous studies have shown the benefits of digital games for learning. Um, they're great for engaging students and motivating students for content knowledge acquisition, conceptual understanding, understanding of complex and abstract concepts, social and higher order thinking skills, but um, there are quite a few factors involved uh, in the effectiveness of digital games in the classroom. The first factor is the game itself, the quality of the game, the instruction design, the features of the game. Uh, the other dimension, let's say, the other factor is just the students. Uh, their individual characteristics, their preferences, probably their previous gaming experience. And the third area, the third factor, the third dimension is the teachers themselves, the teachers who use the games in the classroom. Um, the effectiveness of the games in the classroom um, are linked to the instructional approach the teachers follow, the teachers' attitudes towards games, their previous experience with games, so their game literacy skills, and their experience with technology. And actually, the teachers have a lot to do uh, when they use games in the classroom. Uh, they have to select the, the right game for their learning goals, they have to review games, they have to assess the games, and they have to be able to use the game in the classroom, not just play it, but um, um, develop appropriate, let's say, lesson plans and use the appropriate instructional approaches um, uh, to use the game. So we focus on teachers, and previous studies have shown that um, positive attitudes towards games for learning are not always linked to the use. Um, so even though um, teachers or student teachers have positive attitudes, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually going to use them in the classroom. Uh, and this probably means that, that there is a gap in the awareness of the educators um, about the, the pedagogical dimensions of games, about how to actually use the games in the classroom. So our goal was to examine how to better support future teachers to use uh, games in the classroom effectively. Um, so we started by examining the factors that involved, were involved in the acceptance and the intention of use digital games as learning tools. So we examined the attitudes, the gaming habits of uh, student teachers, um, future teachers, future educators of primary and secondary education. So based on the bibliography, the literature, we had certain hypotheses. Um, I'm not going to um, read this to you. We'll talk about uh, our findings in detail. So I'll skip this slide. Um, our sample was 125 university students uh, from uh, eight different universities in Greece. And we actually, um, we didn't focus on students in education departments as in previous studies. 
in Greece, um, graduates of education departments mainly become teachers of primary education. But we wanted to see what's going on with future teachers in secondary education. So we want to examine uh, students. We wanted to involve students of other university departments. So if you want to become to teach in secondary education, you have uh, to have graduated from the mathematics department, department for example, or the physics department, etc. Uh, most of them were female um, at the point where we did the analysis. Um, most of them were year one. Um, and from eight different universities in Greece. We used an online question, an online survey, and we had 15 items uh, relevant to the main constructs of our hypothesis. So, of course, we examined, uh, we were based mainly on TAM, on the TAM model, technology as acceptance, acceptance model, but we also used the TPK model. So, our first construct was the behavioral intention. Uh, whether the participants intended to use digital games in their classrooms, the perceived usefulness of games as learning tools. Uh, so we made the items more specific, and I'll, I'll show you the, the items later. Uh, their perceived technological um, efficacy with using technology in the classroom. We use the TPAC model, which is um, um, a widely used and validated model uh, uh, focusing on the types of knowledge that are essential um, by the educators for the effective use of learning technologies. Uh, we examined their uh, gaming experience, um, their gender and their year of study. Um, we did a statistical analysis, uh, we used descriptive analysis, we used the correlation analysis to um, uh, see uh, or maybe I'll show you the next slide later. And we used multiple li linear regression. So the descriptive analysis, uh, they were mainly positive about using uh, games in the classroom. So they responded that, yes, we intend to use digital games in the classroom. Um, four is for, the column four is for agree and five is uh, strongly agree. So they were mostly positive, their behavioral intention. The perceived usefulness of games as learning tools was again mostly positive. Um, they agreed and strongly agreed that digital games could increase productivity for students, effectiveness, and uh, they would help students achieve better results. Uh, now concerning their um, readiness, their, their perception of their readiness to use technology in a pedagogic framework. Again, they were mainly positive. They felt able to use technology in the classroom. Uh, concerning their experience, um, although they reported that they played uh, games often, and although they reported that they played different types of games, they were uh, reluctant to um, label them as uh, gamers. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, item number three is probably a problematic item or a, a term, the term gamer. Um, so the correlation analysis showed that the perceived, perceived usefulness of the games, their experience, their technological efficacy were potential predictors of their uh, intention to use uh, in the game, uh, to use the games in the classroom. Uh, they had strong correlations, uh, these three factors, uh, with the behavioral intention. Um, gender, um, well, men reported uh, more expertise than women. Of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that they were actually more experts in games. It's a self-reporting tool, so um, we have to keep that in mind. Um, and the, there was um, a correlation of the year of study they were in uh, with the, um, their um, experience with games. Then we did the regression analysis to identify which factors were actually, had, uh, were actually the strongest predictors for 
using the classroom. And the findings, we summarize the findings here. Uh, so uh, out of the five factors, the two, two of the five factors were significant predictors. The perceived usefulness of the games as learning tools and their experience with games. So the higher the students experience with games, the higher they perceived uh, their intention to use games, the higher they reported that they intend to use games. Um, the other three factors were excluded from the final model because um, the analysis showed no significant effect on the intention. Um, as I said, as previously said, men reported more game experience than women. Um, students with more uh, years of study, they reported more game experience. And there was a positive but very low correlation uh, between gender and technological pedagogical knowledge. Um, so, in conclusion, um, the, the students had moderately, not highly, moderately positive attitudes towards the educational potential of uh, digital games and their intention to use in the classroom. Uh, they had previous experience with games, as I said, but not identify themselves as gamers. Um, the students' experience with games and their perceptions on the usefulness of games to support their learning were well linked to their intention to use games in the classroom. Uh, and this could probably uh, be the two areas that we could support during their university studies. Uh, give them more experience with games and make them understand how they can effectively use them in the, in the classroom for learning. Um, women are reported less experience than men. Um, the gender and the year of studies was not related to the intention of use games. Um, teacher support, uh, education, training is crucial um, for bridging the gap between positive attitudes and actual effective implementation of game-based learning in, uh, in the classroom. Uh, certainly further study is required and we plan to to study it further, to study their gaming habits, their game, uh, game preferences, um, because there are actually very few studies done uh, locally in Greece. So we don't know the, the experience and the habits, the gaming habits of the, of the students. And try to design appropriate uh, game-based learning courses at the university. Thank you very much. I hope I made some sense. Any questions? Of course, it was a self-report uh, instrument, so there are certain bias integrated in that. Um, we tried to include three questions. Uh, so if participants uh, answered these questions, we would exclude them, uh, or negatively worded questions. So we try to decrease the bias as much as possible, but certainly it's a self-report too. Any questions, comments, or ideas, please raise your hands. Otherwise, We'll go to our next presenter, who is Bjorn Bergmarklud. Hi, Bjorn. So, if there are no questions, um, Bjorn, I have your video recording. Bjorn sent us a video. Uh, would you rather show it, uh, share it, or would you rather me to share it? Uh, I don't know, I, Rebecca or Lisa, do you have any suggestions? Otherwise, maybe you can play it, Iro, and just share it. Okay, I'll try. Because I ju I'm just asking because I had some problems with the, with the sound. I hope, uh, I hope it works now. Okay. Sorry. Oh, 
I have it here too, if that's easier, I don't know. Do you have it? Uh, do you have it there? Yeah, I can try. Let's see if the uh, 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 audio works. I guess that's the main thing. Okay, can you see like a video thing? Yeah, yes. And can you hear it? No, actually, when you share it, there is a, a second tab. Oh, sorry. Uh, about the audio, so try to share it again. Um, and in the in the window, uh, in the sharing window, choose computer audio. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Uh, let's try it again. Literacy a trans-historical approach to understanding game-based learning environments. Bjorn Barry Markland, Rebecca Rouse, and Lisa Holloway Adway. <sighs> right, <clears throat> there we go, the hand, grab that, Oop, there it is, and there we go. In this paper, we examine the notion of literacy through a trans-historical lens in order to better understand contemporary discussions of literacy in digital game-based learning research. For scholars, practitioners and pundits, the world of digital game-based learning is still being mapped out, with terminologies and theories constantly fighting over its many territories. Out of all these territories, the one of literacy for interactive experiences is perhaps one of the most contested. But learning from interactive spaces from the past might help us resolve some of these conflicts. To start this examination, we turn to early works in 21st century digital game-based learning research. While there are of course numerous texts to choose from, in the interest of time we will only mention two of the most cited authors in the field, Mark Prensky and James Paul G. Although Mark Prensky's book, Digital Game-Based Learning, is not based on much more than marketing and business practices, and games' potential in those areas, it has had significant influence on digital game-based learning discussions, and terms like the digital native is still heard in current academic writing. In his writings, Prensky states that the native games generation is cognitively different from its predecessors, whether digital immigrants or not, due to the many skills that new technologies have actually enhanced, for example parallel processing, graphics, awareness, and random access. And these have profound implications for their learning. As for James Paul G's work, first and foremost, it is considerably more anchored in peer-reviewed research. As a scholar of linguistics, G looked at games as worlds with new languages and symbols. In order to progress through these worlds, players needed to learn these semiotics, which G connected to learning and literacies. It then follows that the more complex a game is, the more potential it has to infuse the player with knowledge. G states that there are many good principles of learning built into good computers and video games. The stronger any game is on more of the features on the list, the better its score for learning. And it should be noted here that G is referencing a list he established on the features that are connected to learning principles. There are, of course, scholars that have objected to these established viewpoints. For example, Diane Carr, in an examination of the Civilizations game series, the Cry research that emphasized game creators, stating that the point is not that either the novice or the expert is more right about the meaning of civilizations. Furthermore, the meaning of civilization, whatever it might be, is neither universal nor static. But still, for many researchers, a player being game literate still means that they are able to access game content and proficiently progress through it. And as they do, the learning will follow naturally. This is perhaps especially true when we talk about children's play in virtual spaces. This is where game studies at large still lag behind many other fields of research. In almost all other forms of media studies, for example, there's a rich history of discussing the death of authorship. 
and while game literacy research is starting to see instances of these concepts, the influence of early texts like the ones from Prensk NG, among many others, is still being felt. It is not novel to say that the field of digital game-based learning and games literacy is still new, but the notion of newness leads to a form of games exceptionalism, where theories from other fields are considered too outdated to describe this new form of interactive media. However, there are many, many instances of interactive spaces and discussions of literacies that predate digital games, and we could, and perhaps should, learn from these earlier examples more. To find early examples of literacies in interactive spaces, we have gone far back in history. Far, far back. This very brief history is by no means comprehensive, but instead it represents a curated set of examples from a range of time periods that connect in interesting ways with how literacy is defined in relation to digital games. And each example provides an historical look back to another time and another technology in which people engaged interactive storytelling and physical space or representations of space. In one of our earlier examples, we can look at Matthew Paris's itinerary maps from London to Palestine. Paris, a monk at the Abbey of St. Alban in England, created a series of manuscripts around 1250 that included itineraries of pilgrimage routes to Palestine. The maps in these manuscripts included flaps that could fold out from the page, allowing the reader to interactively simulate different itineraries along a route through several major European cities. Paris himself had never made the pilgrimage journey, and it's not clear how he obtained the information to map these routes. It's interesting also to see that even at this early point in the history of the codex form, prior to the age of print, we can find interactivity, meaning the supposedly passive book reader has already always been an interactor, even in the literal sense. In our next example, we find the tradition of the Sacramanti, or sacred mountains, in Italy in the 16th and 17th centuries. These were mountaintop complexes built with series of chapels, each dedicated to telling a particular moment in the story of Christ. These complexes were designed as a kind of virtual pilgrimage for the faithful to make, even when they couldn't travel all the way to the Holy Land. Situated on mountaintops, these themed environments crucially included the experience of physical exertion in climbing to their peaks and visiting each chapel. Chapels were intricately designed, often on a site plan layout intended to simulate or mirror the locations of episodes in Christ's life, with frescoes inside and three-dimensional life-size wooden and terracotta figures fully costumed and positioned as acting out key moments from the biblical text. We could also look to the tradition of the medieval mystery plays in England for another instance of interactive, spatialized storytelling, this time with a participatory element. The mystery plays also served a religious function as liturgical drama, but functioned in complex social and cultural ways as well. These plays were performed on mobile pageant wagons, first decorated by statues, as in the chapels of the Sacramenti, but later replaced by live performers. Technologically, in spite of the lack of a permanent performance space, these productions could become quite complex. Elaborate costumes, props, and masks were used, including large-scale mechanically articulated puppets. Other technologies included everything from pyrotechnics to optical illusions and trap doors, fireworks, candles, mirrors, and even gunpowder. Democracy and Futurama, both at the New York's World Fair from 1939 to 40, both are representations of ideal future cities designed on a radial plan and they feature extensively developed highway systems, presaging the surging rise of the automobile in American culture. While visitors to the Democracy exhibit entered the Paris sphere, 
by walking up an enormous ramp known as the helicline and then strolled around the rotunda space on two slowly rotating platforms to observe a six-minute light show with audio that animated the vast miniature scale model metropolis below, the Futurama visitors sat in single occupancy upholstered segments of a divided bench that rotated around the exhibit with individual speakers piping audio into each cabin of the ride. Again, as in the 1939 to 1940 fair, a second more traditional diorama experience was on display as well, this time in urban planner and fair president Robert Moses' panorama exhibit. Presented in contrast with a model of New Amsterdam in 1660, the panorama presented an up-to-date current scale model of Manhattan, showcasing the many ways in which Moses had reshaped the city. The game of the panorama is to find yourself or find your space in the model. This provides you with a new perspective on your surrounding context and the relative size within that context. Reflecting on the complex literacies required by users or players of these interactive immersive story worlds, we can see that even in the pre-digital world, both designers and players have long been engaged in creating experiences we sometimes today characterize as only unique to games. In conclusion, we believe that a broader understanding of literacy opens up digital game-based learning discussions to more critical perspectives. Games are not uniquely groundbreaking in all matters of interaction or immersive interaction spaces, as we can see by our transhistorical examples. We believe that an expanded understanding of literacy has the potential to enable scholars to view games as an activity, object, setting, and or performance that is intertwined in socioeconomic, cultural, and capitalist pol political traditions and contexts. As such, these literacies are also accessible then to other interdisciplinary critical considerations for games. These might include feminist and gender perspectives, inclusion and disability studies, post-colonialist interpretations, embodiment and affect theory, for example. We must move beyond an ontology of games that centers on instrumentality. If we intend for students to participate in their own transformational learning, not as spectators, but as true actors and co-creators, taking advantage of the immersive body-mind coupling that virtual environments have the potential to facilitate, surely the frame of procedural rhetoric is too limiting for understanding game-based learning and player literacies. Cool. Yeah, that's a bit. Great. Great video, great presentation. Um, I thought it was a different um, view to digital literacy, the study of games, a more uh, historical view. Um, an entirely different perspective. Um, any questions, comments? Um, if I can ask um, uh, your through this um, um, review we, we did um, through this examination of immersive uh, environments um, and uh, environments that um, guided or uh, facilitated the interaction with uh, with people, um, did you find any? elements that we can bring to the study of digital games now you have probably mentioned it in the video but um, did you find any common um, areas any common uh, elements hey there I, I could just say that that's a project we're actually working on right now so this uh, workshop paper was a great beginning for us on this research project and we're working on a longer paper now where we take a larger set of examples, some of which you could see in our video were, were notated kind of playfully as not discussed. 
or not looked at. Um, we, we look at a larger set of examples in the paper we're working on now um, to, to try and do exactly what you suggest, uh, pull out some form, formal characteristics from these historical examples that may be helpful for the design of digital experiences, and maybe some that wouldn't be, some that might be particular to um, you know, historical time, cultural context, or you know, the, the physical materials used in those other kinds of examples. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, if uh, there are no more questions, um, I think um, maybe, I don't know, um, we had scheduled the, the, the Q&A uh, session now, but we're behind schedule. So actually now it's the time to start the, the, the workshop activity with Dimitris, who is here. So if there are no questions, uh, now, I don't know, Dimitris, whether you are able or maybe you need a couple of minutes um, to, to prepare to group your ready. Okay, I hope you are you're all ready. This is going to be we are going to work uh, in groups and uh, design games. Let's say that it's a very exciting, fascinating uh, um, workshop, and the quick glimpse of the, of the workshop, Dimitri is designed specifically for this, uh, for this workshop. So it's the first time you run it, Dimitri, if I'm not uh, uh, wrong, if I'm correct. Can I un unmute you, Dimitri? Okay, hello everyone. Yes, you're correct. Excellent. Um, do you want to start now? I'm ready. Perfect. Okay. If everybody's okay, um, the stage is yours, Dimitris. Okay. I'll be here to, to support. I have the links, I have some material. So we are ready, I think. Okay, you should be seeing my screen now, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, welcome aboard the workshop for those of you who plan to stay. Uh, I should warn you, it's going to take about uh, 90 minutes and uh, we're going to work in teams after uh, half of it. So if uh, you're going to stay that long, please keep on to become a member of the team. So what the workshop is about, it is a participatory workshop. We're gonna do it, most of it all together and the rest of it in groups. It is about speculative design, brain-to-brain -brain interaction technologies and uh, game design. It is not a design competition. So although at some point in time we're gonna do different designs, we're not gonna compete. For most of it, we're gonna work all together. And uh, for, for some reasons I have a strange view on my computer. Just a second, I will close the PowerPoint and start it over again. Sorry for that. Okay, I think it works. Hope it works fine now. Okay. So the main goals of the workshops are creative thinking, having fun, and to conceptually design a BBI game using current or future or even imaginary technologies. The tools we're going to use is Zoom that we are using now, but we're also going to break out in different rooms, Google Docs, Google Slides, and the paper and the pen or pencil. So really simple tools, as well as your brains. Uh, I use a lot of stock photos in my presentations. They're all uh, creative cameras from Pexel, Sunplus, and Pixabay and I have a reference to most of them. And I decided to use a metaphor of a tree for what we're going to do today. So if you see the schedule is upside down. So first uh, I'm gonna set the roots through a brief pre-introduction to speculative design and to the current status and the vision capabilities of the BI technologies. Then we are gonna all work together as a single group 
to grow a common trunk or a pool of ideas. And then uh, we break out in teams of uh, two or three people, depending on how many we are. And each team will uh, separately build upon the trunk that we created to create their own branches. And then uh, we all will meet again here and our common tree blooms as teams present uh, what, they have, what they have grown on their own branches. Okay, so the main title of the workshop is the sixth sense. Uh, the sixth sense is what we call uh, extrasensory perception or ESP. It is a reception of information beyond our commonly recognized senses. So it is something that we can sense with the mind. The term was adopted uh, by the Duke University psychologist J.B. Ryan and it is usually used to denote uh, psychic abilities, like for example, intuition, telepathy, psychometry, etc. In uh, the science fiction novel, 3001, The Final Odyssey by Arthur Clarke, it says that uh, by 2025, humanity has invented something called the brain cup. Uh, anyone wearing this cup is able to merge in real time with other minds over a kind of network. And this tool allows you to transfer knowledge induce positive feelings, cure insomnia and depression, and it can also be used as a communication device. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, according to Clark, one factor that may delay the general adoption of this uh, fantastic device is that it's because it's a very tightly fitting helmet, the wearer would probably have to be completely bald in order to properly use it. So at this point in time, I would like to pause and have a quick uh, word around every one of you and just state uh, your name, where you are located, what you do, and uh, which is your most favorite food. So, Iro, can you moderate that? And uh... Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, those of you who are here, yes, just please stand on your cameras. So, let's start um, um, from the top of my of my camera views with uh, Bjorn. Okay, those were rough questions. Well, not the first three. That's fine. <laughs> Bjorn Bergmarklund. Uh, I'm located in Sweden, in Skövde, a very tiny town in the dead center of Sweden. And I'm a senior lecturer here at the University of Skövde and a, I don't know, industry contact almost from here too. Mm -hmm. I hate anything with like capers in it, I think. Not my favorite. Mm -hmm. okay, That's probably what it is. <laughs> Great. Maybe Giorgio Tiapa then? Yeah, all right. So, uh, yeah, my name is Giorgio and I currently reside in Berlin where I am a PhD student and I also teach language on the language on the side, specifically Italian. Uh, most hated food would be beetroot. I think it looks gross, it tastes gross, and I don't like it. So that's it. <laughs> Great. Um, Leonid? Um, hello, my name is Leonid. Um, I also reside in Berlin. I'm a master's student by now of comparative literature at the uh, Freie Universität of Berlin. And my most hated food is the raisin and all that is related to it. Raisin, mm. Got it? Yeah, my name is Garrett. Uh, I live in Eau Claire, Wisconsin in the United States. I'm an undergraduate computational neuroscience student and also do a multimedia program. And my most hated food would be cilantro. It tastes like soap, uh, <laughs> but I think I just have bad genes. <laughs> Um, um, Nasif Rizani. Uh, yeah, hello. Sorry, I don't have a camera, but I, I'm Nasif Rizani from uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. I'm currently in my first year of PhD study in uh, entertainment technology in J Japan Advanced Japan Span, uh, I'm sorry, Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and the food that I hate most is probably porridge and every food that have same texture texture as porridge. Oh. Yeah. Very, very interesting choice. Okay. Perfect. Um, anyone else I'm missing? I think not. Okay, you can say it or two. 
Oh, uh, hi, Miro. Um, right now, I'm in Athens, Greece. What do I do? Um, a few things. Uh, teaching at the University of Athens. Uh, I have this meditation. I do some research in digital games and learning technologies in general. Um, my most hated foods, God, uh, um, seafood. I hate seafood, uh, like oysters and stuff. I've never tried it. I find it disgusting. Okay, by the way, I'm uh, Dimitris. I'm currently located in uh, Crete, in Greece. I'm a computer scientist, I'm a researcher, and uh, my main domain is human computer interaction. So, Garrett, excuse me if I say anything uh, that is not very correct about the neuroscience stuff I'm going to talk about. And I uh, really don't like okra. You know, it probably has this strange texture or hairy stuff. Anyway, so first of all, I'm going to talk about design, which is more safer ground for me, and about speculative design. Uh, usually, design is mostly associated with things like problem solving, making technology easy to use, sexy and consumable, and creating products. But on the other hand, what we call speculative design is about uh, hypothesizing about things could be and challenging how things are, imagining possible futures, which may be desirable or not, and posing problems instead of solving them. And eventually, what you do with speculative design is that you create ideas rather than products, something that we call useful fictions. In a book called Speculative Design, June and Rapp state that uh, as designers, we need to shift from designing applications to designing implications by creating imaginary products and services that situate these uh, new developments within everyday material culture. As the science fiction writer Frederick Paul once remarked, a good science fiction story should be able to predict not the automobile, but the traffic jam. So in this book I mentioned earlier, Speculative Design is a great book by MIT Press. It has several examples of potential future technologies. I will present just a few of them that I really like just to get idea, some idea what uh, speculative design is about. There's this device that they call it the quantum parallelograph. And it examines the scientific and philosophical ideas surrounding the theory of quantum physics and multiple universes. So what this device does, it gives you a split second glimpse into your life in possible parallel universes. So it has this uh, dial and you can select how far from your current reality you want to search for your other selves. And then the device randomly selects from a database of online resources uh, based on your name, what you do and how you're feeling. And it prints out a small narrative about what your other self is doing in another universe right now. And this is a similar device that takes photos in parallel universes. And there's something that we humans do, it's called uh, facial micro expressions. They last, uh, last less than a second and they're almost impossible to control. So there are six scenarios based on the idea that at some point in time, neuroscience can capture and understand these micro expressions that even we cannot. So one of the scenarios is a system that looks at the facial expressions of newly married couple, and it can predict the likelihood of being divorced within 15 years with an accuracy of 90%, just of the facial micro expressions that they do when they meet each other. Uh, this is another example, this is a surprise vending machine. So the idea is that if you want to buy a teapot, you stand in front from this machine, then it flashes like hundreds of different teapots in front of your eyes, and then it stops at the one you want to buy, but you didn't know it yet. And then there is this uh, other technology called the uh, weather modification. It's called the uh, cloud seeding. And what you do with this is that you can modify the structure of a cloud in order to increase the chance of rain or snow. So in theory, beyond just uh, increasing or changing the chance, you could also make uh, what falls have a specific flavor. So this is like uh, an ice cream van and you can see clouds to produce flavored snow. So you see that they, all these ideas take uh, advanced or future technologies and they try to create some kind of products to, to play with the whole idea. But if we want to design alternative futures, somehow we must be able to think of them. 
So there is this uh, framework that is called the Futures Cone. It was created in 2003 by Josef Foros and in 2017 created a new version because there was a lot of criticism. And this is a tool that usually a lot of designers, they use to speculate about the future. So what you see here is that everything beyond now, it is a potential future. And then you have this uh, whole typology. For example, you have the preposterous futures. These are the futures that we believe they are ridiculous or impossible, all will never happen. Then closer to reality, we have the possible futures. The futures that we think that they might happen based maybe on some future knowledge that we do not possess yet, but we think that we might possess someday, like for example, a warp drive. And then we have uh, all those plausible futures, the futures that we think could happen based on our current understanding of how the world works, the physical laws, the social processes, the current technology. And then we have the probable futures, the, thing, the futures that we think will, were likely to happen based on the current trends. So we see the current trends, we extrapolate 10 years and we say, okay, this is where, like for example, technology of computers will be. And then there's just one single future, which is called the projected future. What will happen if almost nothing changes? So we see the past, we see now. So we say, if we don't have uh, anything uh, very surprisingly, this is the future that's gonna happen. It's, uh, let's say, the most probable of the probable futures. And on top of all that, we can have, of course, the set of all the preferable futures. For example, the futures that we would like to happen. And of course, the opposite, the futures that we don't want to see happening. For example, global climate change. So these tools let you play with ideas by imagining in which kind of future this will rely. For example, it can be an idea, a design for a non-preferable future that it's almost impossible to happen. Uh, this person here, Professor James Dator, he's the director of the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies, and he has uh, created these three laws in order to explain what future studies are. So his second law of the future states that any useful idea about the futures should appear ridiculous. And this is because it may be challenging the norms of society, maybe we cannot fit it in our current mental model, or maybe because technology will change so much that it will be impossible to grasp right now. By the way, the other two laws of the future are that the future cannot be predicted because uh, the future does not exist and that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools save us. Okay, so I will pause here and we will play a small game. We'll make an exercise, it's called BBI. So I would like you in the next uh, one minute to think what uh, the three letter acronym BBI could stand for, okay? It can be anything. You can find uh, more than one acronyms. So you have uh, one minute to come up with ideas for what BBI stands for. Okay, you can uh, write them down. You can just uh, keep them in your head. I'll give you one minute. Okay, in the example I have here on my screen, I found that it also stands for the British Bottlers Institute. <laughs> Does anyone have an idea that uh, he wants to share with us? You can just raise your arm and just uh, open can your be, mic and say. Can it be a really silly idea and completely yes, of course. relevant to the topic? Yes. Be bravely rational. Okay. <laughs> the first thing I found. <laughs> Any other ideas? No? 
or you can type them in the chat here. Yeah, you can also chat them. Okay. In our case, uh, BBI stands for brain-to-brain -brain interaction. So brain-to-brain -brain interaction is achieved by a direct brain-to-brain -brain interfaces that combine neuroimaging and uh, neurostimulation methods. So a brain-to-brain -brain interface extracts specific content uh, from the neural signals of uh, center brain, and then it digitizes it and delivers it to a receiver brain. So BBI rests on two pillars the capacity to read or decode usually information from neural activity, and then the capacity to write or encode digital information back into neural activity. And uh, this guy here, Miguel Nicolelis, uh, he's a Brazilian scientist. He's one of the pioneers in uh, the domain. Is this correct, Garrett? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, I know this guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So he, he published this book called Beyond Binaries, and he describes the merging of human brain activity as the future of humanity and the next stage in our species evolution. So he envisions this uh, brains in the future where uh, we do everything using our brain simply by thinking. So we don't have to rely on body movement. We do not have to rely on language. For example, we can control machines. We can communicate with people. We can experience the surface of a distant planet or even access the thoughts of uh, dead forefathers and uh, relieve their experiences. So this is like uh, the dream. But I'm um, going to briefly go through the current state of the art of the research I found, of what we have achieved up to now in brain-to-brain -brain interfaces. So one of the first examples is rat-to-rat uh, -rat communication. So you have two rats and they're cooperating. One of them is the encoder, so he experiences something and the other has to replicate this experience. For example, on the, the screen here to the top, we have an experiment where the encoder rat sees an LED, and when the LED turns on, he has uh, to press a lever to get a reward, like uh, a few drops of water. And then the other rat does not see any, any LED, and he has to press the exactly the same lever. And if he does it, they both get a reward. In the bottom example, the encoder rat has to decide using uh, its whiskers if uh, an aperture is uh, narrow or wide. And depending on the answer, it either pokes with his nose uh, left or right. And then the decoder rat has to do exactly the same thing just by feeling in its whiskers the same experience that the other one felt. And the next example is a human to anesthetized rat interaction. So we have a human wearing this cap and using his brain he can send the trigger and the tail of an anesthetized rat is moving, quite simply. Uh, the next level is we have two monkeys cooperating together. There is separate rooms and each one is uh, looking at a computer monitor that shows a virtual avatar of an arm from a first person perspective. So one of the monkeys can control the X axis of the arm and the other the Y. And they have to cooperate in order to make the arm touch the virtual ball. And uh, the next example is using three monkeys and they're cooperating in 3D space. Each one has control over two dimensions of the arm, so that all three of them have to cooperate to make the arm touch the ball. And the next level of interaction is a human brain to a cyborg cockroach. So the human, through his, using his brain, can make the cockroach move through this uh, S-shaped uh, track and uh, they managed to do that with an accuracy of 20%. And then we have a human to a cyborg rat control. And uh, this time you have two different of, uh, mazes, one simple maze with just eight legs. So using your brain, you have to control the rat to go to this one of the eight legs of this uh, track. But they even achieved to do it in a complex maze like the one below where the rat had to do all this uh, track, cover this track in just five minutes. In all these cases, the, the humans were in just a cup where the animal has implanted brain interface. So our next exercise is called Animaster. So I want you to think, if you could control an animal with your brain, which animal would you like to control? And what would you do with it? Okay, one minute. Is it the whole species or an individual animal? 
you can decide. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, do we have any suggestions or ideas? I was going to say, I, I would go with birds in general, so they start shitting on my car. That would be my main. <laughs> okay. Leonid, do you want to say something? Yeah, I also thought about pigeons partially for the same reason, partially because, because I would try out um, how it feels to annoy other people while being a pigeon, because they certainly annoy me once in a while. Um, I'd also go with a wasp for the same reasons, but that one might actually get swatted, so I'd rather not. Okay, anyone else? Actually, I also thought of birds, but I thought of something like uh, eagles or something like this, and then maybe getting the experience. So I was more naive. <laughs> yeah, you know. Initially, I thought about birds too, for the same reason, for flying. I was naive as well. And then, I don't know, the, those sea creatures that live in the deep sea came into mind. So I could safely explore a very scary environment, like a deep sea kilometers under the surface of the air where it's dark. So I don't know. This came to mind. Okay, anyone else wants to say something? Okay. So the next examples are uh, human to human uh, brain interaction, non invasive. So the first demonstration uh, found in 2013, they're playing a very simple game. Uh, the sender is watching a computer screen with a very simple game. And at some point in time, he imagines firing using his right hand, but he doesn't move the hand. So the other person in the room is uh, just holding the keyboard without seeing the actual uh, screen of the game. And uh, when the sender decides that he should press the button, then uh, the person on the keyboard receives like a stimulus that makes him push the button. So it's like a, a trigger, an involuntary trigger that makes you press this button. Uh, the next example was a little more complex. It's like a question and answer game. So you have one person who knows the answer, for example, the answer is dog, and the other person has a web interface and you can make questions. And uh, the sender has to reply yes or no using his brain. So he can see two different LEDs, and by looking at one LED, it means yes, the other means no. And the receiver receives something like a visual percept. If you receive it, it means yes. So part of uh, the whole communication is through conventional means and part of it is uh, through brain interaction and then you have to find the answer to the, to the question. And the first successful demonstration of multi-person and invasive uh, direct brain-to-brain -brain interaction was done with uh, two senders and one receiver. And once more it's a game. It's a game like Tetris and you have two people that they can see the whole screen of the game so they can see the shape that you can rotate and then the line that you have to fill. And then the receiver does not see the bottom line. So he doesn't know if he has to rotate the shape in order to fit or not. And what he can do is, uh, using his brain, he can set a signal to rotate it. And then the other two persons can think if it should be rotated or not. So it's, uh, he receives the signal that should be rotated and using his brain, he sends a signal to rotate this. Once more, they use a game. 
And maybe recently, about uh, two, three weeks ago, you've seen a presentation by Elon Musk. He founded this uh, startup back in 2016 called Neuralink. And the idea is that uh, he wants to develop an implantable brain machine interface. And his goal is to do it for helping humans keep pace with advanced AI. So he thinks that this is the, the only way to win AI. And to the left, you see the old model that they had presented. And to the right, you see the current model that they presented in August 2020. And the idea is that uh, they drill one hole on your head, and they implant it, and then they cover it again. And every night, you have to wirelessly charge it in order to, to function. And actually, if you want more than one, you open more holes on your head, and you have uh, more implants. And uh, in mass presentation, he presented this big uh, Gertrude, who has the implant and is connected to neurons in her snout. So whenever she sniffs around, you get some blips and you can see some pigs here. So currently they can just uh, read signals uh, from the pigs. And of course, uh, the moment uh, this technology appeared, you also had articles saying that uh, this kind of interfaces could be hacked and they could let uh, thieves steal thoughts and memories uh, from our brains. Uh, current technologies have a lot of limitations. So, for example, currently we cannot transmit complex ideas between people, mainly because we still don't know how the brain encodes complex ideas, and we cannot transmit uh, emotions, inner thoughts, memories, and feelings because they are confined to the analog domain of the brain. So, currently we just uh, detect and send simple stuff mostly uh, related to motor functions. Okay, but the idea is, is that in the future we'll be able to do all this amazing stuff. And then, of course, you have all these ethical issues. For example, you would like to protect your brain against illegitimate, uh, illegitimate access to the information that is in there. If you are a receiver, you should be able to control what type of information you receive and from who and when. Uh, and of course, you have to be able to protect your brain from potential harm. And uh, there's also this problem that uh, if I'm a receiver and I do something because the sender made me do it, who is responsible for my action? And uh, finally, we have all this stuff about the reliability of senders. We have all this kind of fake news, we have brain hacking. So there are a lot of things that can go uh, very, very wrong. Maybe you know this uh, Yuval Noah Harari, he's an Israeli historian. Uh, he writes many books about the past and the future of humankind. And he writes a lot about things like free will, consciousness, intelligence, and happiness. And uh, a few months ago, he had this article in the Wall Street Journal. It was like a commencement speech for the class of 2020. And it started with the words, congratulations, you are now hackable animals. So it had to do with how technology, in the very near future, it would be able to know more about yourselves than you know about yourselves. In uh, all of the literature I wrote, the, the main scenario that I found about future applications of this kind of technology are this one. One is emergency. So you have an airplane and the pilot uh, has become incapacitated. So then you have a passenger or a flight attendant, they wear the cap and somebody from the ground, they can help him land the, the plane. Another domain is education, where you have a teacher that can convey, for example, a mathematical proof directly to your brain. So you do not have to study it. In training, for example, you can have the medical students that can learn a very complex surgical skill directly from the mentor's mind. So the mentor is uh, doing uh, uh, the, the thing right now, and you're learning while the mentor is doing it. And a lot of examples have to do with the rehabilitation. So for example, you can teach another person a, rehab a new motor skill that maybe their brain has forgotten how it works or didn't have it at all, and you can directly transfer it instead of the person having to learn it through a lot of months. And finally, there are a lot of scenarios with communication. We replace phones and the internet because now we communicate through our brains. And then there is this dream of the brainnet, who is going to be on top or replace the internet. So we have uh, a biological su supercomputer of network human brains, and they all work together. They're uh, more powerful than any computer or any AI that can be out there and we have better performance, and we do not have to rely on our bodies or on our language. What is interesting, interesting that uh, although in a lot of the research, they use uh, digital games to test uh, BBI technologies, 
Still, in all the scenario I could find, games are not envisioned as a potential future application of this technology. So they mostly think about uh, work or useful stuff, but they do not think about all the great games probably you could uh, develop. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to play a brain-to-brain -brain interaction game with you, okay? So the game is the following one. I'm gonna look at the drawing, which is made of simple shapes, and you're gonna draw it, okay? And uh, because uh, we do not possess this technology, I'm gonna just say out loud what would be communicated through our brains, okay? And the rules are quite simple. Let's say that the drawing is this one. I can only tell you the type of the shape I see, and I'm gonna say the type of the shapes starting from top left going to bottom right. For example, for this drawing, I would say something like uh, big triangle, big long rectangle, small square, small square, small square. Okay? Did you get it? Okay. Let's try it out. So have a pen or pencil and piece of paper. And then we can probably show their... Yes, and then you can pro the show it to the camera and see what you came up with. Okay, Bjorn? Oh dear. Okay, so let's start. Big triangle. Small circle. Smaller circle. Small triangle. Okay, should I go over it once more? Okay, I will say it once more. It was big triangle, small circle, smaller circle, small triangle. Okay, does anyone want to, to show to the camera what he came up with? Oh, it's a car, okay. Anyone else? Okay, it's a something, okay. <laughs> so this is what I was looking at. It was a big triangle, small circle, smaller circle, and a small triangle. Okay, L let's try one more. Small, tall rectangle. Small, long rectangle. Small circle, smaller circle, another smaller circle, small triangle, and the big circle. Did anyone draw something? No? Leonid, do you have something? Oops. Yeah, I have something, but uh, can I show it like by sharing my screen? Because I use yeah, sure. Paint to show yeah, it. Sure. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. I cannot share while I, someone is sharing. So. Hmm. Can you tell us what it is? is? Is it something? So it's kind of like a uh, hammer hitting okay. uh, Cyclops head. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's like the uh, the big circle, uh, the last big circle is the, the, the Cyclops head, but I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, so this was my shape. It was a small rectangle, a long rectangle. It was a circle, small circle, another smaller circle, smaller rectangle, and the big circle. Okay. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move to the part where we are going to try to design some kind of game. We're going to do the conceptual design of a VBI game. 
it might use uh, current or future technology. So first, let's try to explore the design space. What are the available options for design in the game? And this we're going to do it all together. Okay. And the idea is that we're not going to uh, come up with a, some kind of formal ontology of everything that we can think of. We're going to just collect stuff and ideas. And we're going to do this on a shared uh, Word document. Uh, you know, can you send the link to everyone? Uh, yes, I'm chat? sorry. Yes, yes. The shared design document. I'm yeah. sharing it in the chat. So everyone can write in this document as we move on. Of course, keep in mind that we want to create a brain-to-brain -brain interaction game. So maybe you want to focus your ideas in this domain. Uh, okay, one of the first things about the game is the players. Okay, who are the players of our game? Uh, an easy answer is to say that anyone can play our game. What, but what does this mean? For example, is it a game that adults can play? And uh, when we say adults, for example, an elderly person can play this game. And if it's just uh, beyond adults for kids, does this include babies? And then maybe can we have uh, families? So we have adults and uh, children playing together. Can people with various disabilities play the game? And uh, maybe we can think of other uh, categories, like for example, it's a game for couch potatoes, okay? So I'm gonna paste this in the document and you can write any other idea that you might have regarding players. Can you not think of players that would like or you want to play this game? Try to focus on the players, Anonymous Koala. <laughs> and then we will move on to the other categories. Okay, locked in syndrome. Does anyone have any idea about who we would like to design the game for? Okay. Another question is, will it be a game just for human brains? In most of the research, for example, they use rats or they use chimps. Should we also include them in the game? And what about other animals, like for example, dolphins that are very intelligent and they're in the water? And uh, what about other forms like plants? Can we include plants in our game? And uh, what about AI? It's intelligence. So maybe some of the players are not humans. We connect through AI, through our brains. And since it can be about any type of future, could it be a game, for example, where we can play with aliens? And it could be maybe a game to dominate the universe or whatever. So you can add any kind of brains you would like to see here in your games. You can add, I will add the pigeons for you. <laughs> Oops. Oops, sorry. sorry like <laughs> okay, and of course, the, the other question is uh, how many people or whatever are going to play this game? Is it just uh, a single player game? So it's a brain solitaire. Is it a two-player game? Is it a game for a small group of people? Do you need to have teams to play it? Could you play with a big crowd, for example, at an event, we play this game and everybody plays with a brain? Can everyone on the planet play at the same time? Uh, just a quick question here. Sure. Uh, we're brainstorming at the moment, right? So, yep. yes. okay, so we can display completely different ideas that have nothing to do yes. with Yes, the okay. idea is that we have a common pool of ideas. So you have uh, something to start from and get some inspiration about your game. So it doesn't matter who writes what now. Okay, great, thank you. And it's okay if you write something and somebody else does it. It's, it's not a competition. And uh, 
The next question is, where are the players located? Okay, you can say, for example, that it's, a, it's a game that you can play at home. But, uh, for example, does this include that uh, you can play it while you're having a bath? Can you play it outdoors? Uh, can you play it on the move? Uh, do you need a special place like a stadium? So you have a stadium for this kind of games, or the fans, etc. Uh, do you have to play it in the lab because you have this special equipment? Uh, can you play it in the pub with all the drinking and things that happen around? Uh, can you play it with other space? So for example, astronauts can have it as a pastime between them and their families on Earth. So I will add these ideas to the spaces. Okay. And uh, of course, when we play games, uh, another basic thing is the motivation. Why am I playing the game? Is the game I play just for having fun? Is it uh, for the thrill of it? So it's something that uh, makes uh, my whole body pump up. Is it an educational game? Uh, is the game uh, do for uh, getting fame, like for example, these uh, video shows, uh, TV shows, so I can become famous through this game? Uh, maybe I gain some money through it. Is it this uh, scenario like Hunger Games, where I play it in order to survive in a post apocalyptic future? Is it a game I play to reach enlightenment? So I need some reason in order to start playing this game. And probably this will also lead the kind of the game that I'm going to design. And of course, a much broader element is the theme of the game. Okay, so what is the subject matter the game is built around? Of course, you can have thousand different themes to choose from. It can be like a sports game, so it's a brain sports game. You have uh, superheroes with all superpowers, mind powers. You can have magic. Uh, you can have exploration in the wild or in different planets. It can be a horror game inside your game, which can be really, really horrible. And it can be also an abstract game, like uh, I don't know, chess or a domino. So it doesn't have a very specific theme. And anything you can, you can think of. And of course, in, in most games, you have some kind of conflict. So usually you have a competition. You can have only one winner. So everyone has to compete in order not to lose. Sometimes we have team competition. So you win or lose together with others. Uh, sometimes you have just cooperation. So either we all win or we all lose. And of course, you can have different mixes. For example, the game could be cooperative up to a point, And then it becomes competitive and only one wins. And of course, there are some games where you do not have conflict. It's more like uh, toys or play. You have free play and you do it just for the fun of playing or being with others. And of course, this will also shape a lot uh, the mechanics and the theme and what happens in the game. So conflict is usually a very basic thing in all of the games. So now here we have a pool of at least uh, seven different things that uh, when you decide each one of them, it's going to lead your game to different paths. And of course, when you create a game, you need to think of the rules, what you can and cannot do in the game, how you can do it, and how you cannot do it, and if there are any winning or losing conditions. And this is what you have to describe in order to have a game. Also, in brain-to-brain -brain interaction, another big challenge is playtesting. Okay? You have to test your game but now this game is played inside people's minds. So if it has bugs or if you didn't think very well about it, what will happen to the brain of those people? So maybe it's good to find the, the, find the strategies for play testing that might do not destroy the players' uh, minds before the, the game is ready. And of course, you have to think in which of the futures your game takes place. Also, Try to write one sentence pitch why your game is so cool, so how you sell your game. And of course, take into account the ethical issues. Okay, so all this, uh, we're gonna show you some presentation you have to prepare as a team. 
is the things you're going to think about. But of course, you don't really have a game unless you have a name for it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to present you here as an inspiration some of uh, the name of games that have been voted the worst game, game names ever. So there was this Nintendo game called uh, Princess Put Tomato in Salad Kingdom. Uh, we had Ninja Golf. We had uh, Beyond the Beyond, Way Past the Far Out. We had uh, Silhouette Mirage, Reprogrammed Hope, Palette Timid Waffle. And there was also Mobile Shoot Gundam, Gundam versus Zeta Gundam. So our last uh, common exercise is called the name of the game. So I want you to try to come up with a nice name for a BBI game, even if it's not the game you're going to design. But just uh, start thinking about possible names for a game. I already have one here. What if this is all real? OK, so for the next couple of minutes, try to come up with names. And maybe your game will emerge just from the name you thought about. Okay, do we have any names? Georgia, do you want to say something? Or? Uh, I, I jotted down three of them, but I think they're all quite terrible. Okay. Uh, they're, they're all based on, I mean, I had jotted down some notes about language learning as a possibility. Mm -hmm. And the things that I have are pillow talk. Pillow talk, yeah. Told you so, yes. and don't blink. Okay, that, 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 we're fine. Leonid, do you have something? Um, yes, but it's pretty silly, and I hope that's okay. Yeah. Um, Kingdom Animalia, where you get to compete in a mix of uh, mini games mm -hmm. with different compositions and different kind of well, mini game frames uh, with or against other animals and or humans. Mm -hmm. And depending on the complexity, you could um, take it to different extremes, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Garrett, do you have a name? Yeah, I put something down about like overlaying an alternate reality game on top of reality. So I just called it Reality the Expansion Pack. Okay. <laughs> Bjorn, 
Do you have a name? Uh, kind of. I'm just, I've got this phrase in my head still. Well, it's not, I didn't invent it, it's a quote. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I, I know the phrase. Okay, yeah. Nazif? We can't see you, so we don't know if you want to see something. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I'm thinking like animals, like men plus animals. So okay. it's like uh -huh. uh, alternate reality where human and animals like live together as like people to people. So like people to animal, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I have done is I created a, a game name evaluator. So to the top, uh, you, if you have more than one candidate names, you can put the names and then uh, I have different ways for uh, different criteria on the scale from one to 10. So for example, here's an example for what if this is all real. So if you have more than one names, you can rate them and then decide about it. I've, uh, Iro will share with you an online version of it. And in the presentations that uh, the team will prepare, you also have it in there. So when you decide one or more names about you, you can have more than one names for your game. You can also use the evaluator to select one of them. Okay, so now we're gonna move to the part that we're gonna split in teams in design. Uh, Iro, have you decided how to split people in teams? I think we have five people, excluding um, me mm -hmm. and you. So maybe two teams, one team with three people and one team with two people. You, can, uh, you could join the other team if you want. Um, yeah, I'll see how it goes. <laughs> I kind of have to give a heads up. So I have to catch a train in like 10 minutes. So I'm really, okay. I won't be very useful there. Okay. okay. Sure. So then we have two teams of two people. Mm -hmm. So I'll try to break you into two. So, sorry, since we are four, what do you prefer? Do you want to be all in one team? Oh. Or do you prefer to be in two teams? <laughs> it's up to you. Do you have any opinion on this? Garrett, Leonard, Giorgio? Two what people is maybe kind of a small number for a team. Uh, okay. is, what I, is what I'm thinking about. Maybe we should just stick together. Okay, yeah. okay. So we have one team. <laughs> and uh, what will happen now is that uh, Iro will share with you um, do we need to break into rooms or just stay here? You can stay here, yes, we don't need to break okay. into rooms. Uh, so, so you get a link to this template. Mm -hmm. And in this template, you can uh, note down all the details about your game. It's all the things we discussed. Of course, you can change the slides, you can delete some of them, you can add more slides. So this is like a scaffold to help you put the main things about your game. Okay, so the idea is that in the next uh, 30 minutes you discuss on the ideas on the game. You can also use the, the common uh, document that we start together and uh, see what happens. Um, unless you want to um, create a breakout room, just maybe you feel more comfortable in a different room. It's up to you. I think the simple thing is we can stay here. And we can even share. So we can all work as one group. Okay? Yep. So the, you have the link to the shared document. And uh, probably somebody has to take the lead from the team and start asking others or state their idea. Do you want us to leave the room? Will that make you more comfortable? I'm sure nobody just wants to be totalizing and take over control of the entire game. <laughs> Good point. But you do not have to. You can just uh, start with something. Yeah, something that I was thinking was, um, so instead of reality, the expansion pack, I also thought of the phrase consensual hallucinations. So mm -hmm. 
consensual hallucination. Yeah. Sounds Again, fun. sort of like an alternative reality game, but you know, that's very broad, right? You're just seeing the same thing, therefore it's real. Um, and I heard a lot of ideas about sort of animals and um, that sort of theme. And so maybe we could apply that sort of alternative reality game concept to an animal themed mm -hmm. alternative reality game. I don't know if anybody has other thoughts on that. One thing to work is to start from the easier decisions. So for example, you can decide on the players, who are the players. So probably this would be quite easy to decide. You can change it, of course, later. And uh, how many of them. So this will give you a starting idea and you can build on that. So maybe try to find who are the players. So for example, humans and other stuff. Okay. Should I help? <laughs> okay, we'll do Okay, the, the easy question is, will there be humans? Yeah. I guess, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone have in mind a specific type of humans? Like specific age or characteristics or whatever? I think a children's game would be kind of fun, but you know, that goes very speculative where it's, it's legal to implant your kid with one of these brain devices at an early age, almost at birth. Okay, so do we include children or not? Giorgio, children well, or maybe, not? Maybe not, maybe let's stick to adults, but it was just wondering, since it's about sharing hallucinations and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. Should we, I don't know, try with different, uh, two different kind of adults, maybe in different stages of our lives, or maybe doing something different with our lives, I don't know. I think it would be interesting to, to mix it up a little bit, per se in the, the realms of uh, adulthood, just not, yeah. So what kind of adults, what are the categories? I don't know, maybe if we go by two players or so, one could be in his early 30s and the other, be, the other one could be 50 or so, I don't know. Okay, when well, they have uh, age gap, let's say. Mm -hmm. So, you mentioned another dimension. So, will this be a two player game? So, I think when we have two different age groups, it makes sense to create teams. Maybe I'm wrong about that, um, but mm -hmm. Giorgio, it sounds like that's where you were going with it. Yeah, that could be an idea, yeah. Okay, let's see. Two teams. Of course, all this can change. How big are those teams? Mm. There, there's no right or wrong. Okay, we have no idea what we're designing. So maybe let's keep them on the smaller side. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, two people per team, two or three people per team. I don't know. Okay. Okay, do we have other brains? Animals, AI, plants, aliens? Maybe we could look at the other document, the shared document. Okay, I can have them both on my screen. Okay. What kind of brains would you like to see in this game? Nazif? I don't know. I used to watch a lot of movies, uh, fantasy movies. So mm -hmm. I really like the idea of like men to like animals work together as like partners. So if mm -hmm. it's possible, then mm -hmm. communication between humans and 
like selected animals will be great. I guess. Do you have any like, preference on animals? Hmm. I think if we're looking at an urban landscape, I mean, that's also an undecided topic, but if, mm -hmm. if we go for more urban area, there's a lot of, you know, rats, cockroaches, mm. bunch, pigeons, um, <laughs> that you could just, you know, there's no ethical, like, guidelines by public policy to, like, take a bunch of pigeons and implant them with your implant, which is what you'd need. You need them to be on a network of some sort. Okay. So in the teams, we have uh, people, and are the animals part of the team, or they're just there? <laughs> game pieces? I don't know. <laughs> game pieces? <laughs> okay, so, so the, the, the humans are like controllers, and they control this. Okay. And uh, you said that, uh, okay, the, where are the players located? The play from home, it's like an internet game or it's a, like a special event, they're in a stadium for this, it's an event thing. It's a, Or maybe if we if we go by this idea that we have that we want them to experience hallucination, I think that we should guarantee that they are in a safe space. Uh, maybe I don't know a room in some kind of university or something like that. Maybe not too public because if something like if if, if we want if we want them to be quiet, they should be like in an enclosed space and not too not surrounded by people or stuff. Okay, so it's like this. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you said something about the theme. It is an urban game or something like this. So, does anyone have any ideas in this direction? Yeah, I do really like Nassif's ideas about sort of human and animal hybridity almost, or control over animals, um, and also sort of linking it with this idea of hallucinations. But at this point, I don't s quite see the connection that we're making between those two things, because it could be, you know, like, you're kind of a sorcerer of like animals, of like urban animals. But then that's not a hallucination, right? That's real. That's like you're controlling real things. Mm -hmm. um, and so a hallucination is almost like a overlay virtual environment or like alternate augmented reality over the world that's in a digital space. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Nazif was saying, was telling us before that he really liked to, to watch his fantasy movies and blah, blah, blah. So maybe we should go for an urban fantasy theme or something like that. If you want to have a human animal hybrid, but in an urban environment, something like that. I don't know. What is an urban fantasy? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm just ripping <laughs> off. But I did hear the term sometimes. Like, I think there are a series of video games that take place in an urban fantasy environment where it's modern world or it's contemporary, mm -hmm. but it has a fantasy element on it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just an idea. Okay. Nazif, do you know anything about this? Urban fantasies? I was, I was thinking, like, it's kind of... Uh, uh, have you guys played Pokemon Go? So... It's like the partners are like human and the Pokemon, right? And Poke we can assume that Pokemon is the animal. So uh, we we uh, I think it could be like augmented reality games with like GPS maps where the players have to be in the specific place, like to mm -hmm. check in or to mm -hmm. 
solve puzzle in a place and then like the clues can be around and you can use the other animals to help you like find the clues or like solve it together or like uh, mm -hmm. the the problem could be solved by one specific animal's skills that humans doesn't have mm -hmm. so it's like combination co uh, cooperation of human anim and animal with their own like specific or unique skill uh, yeah but it's not uh, that we, that means we need to consider about the location mm -hmm. because previously it was discussed that the location should be in the safe place um, but uh, the, the animals don't have to be in the safe space. <laughs> this was the idea. So the, the, the humans, they're there and they're controlling the animals that can be anywhere. For example, they can even be in the shoes of the city or underneath the city or, or in a post-apocalyptic scenario. Maybe everything is destroyed up there and you have all of these mutant animals that can go. <laughs> And humans are confined. Yes, because you can also decide which future your game takes place. So th this will also make help. So where do you want to go in the future? <laughs> How far do you think our game takes place from now? And what kind of future is it? Is it a great future? Maybe it's a great future and everything is so fantastic that humans play this game just to pass their time and uh, and maybe even this future urban animals are i don't know uh, tigers and leopards <laughs> and uh, because the, the what we call urban is completely different from what we call now so you make the rules but we have to put some of them so that we save it okay does anyone has a saying about in which future our game takes place how far in the future and is it a good future bad future something similar that we experience today i was sort of thinking of two ideas so one was that the animals are the hallucinations and they're like they're operating in a digital space and so mm -hmm. they're not cons like we're not constrained by like physical limitations of movement and like a two to some hours long game rather than like 30 minute immediate feedback mm -hmm. um as for the future, I was, in that sense, it would be like a sort of techno utopian, like urban civilizations. The other way we could go with it is like there's some sort of apocalyptic event in urban environments and um, cities, there's like an abandoned city that's been taken advantage of by a game company that uses it mm -hmm. to like play this game in a, like a real city, right? But you're controlling like wild animals almost like at a zoo and it's just a protected environment. Okay, a lot of ideas there. So is it a, a positive future or a negative? Does anyone, we are, you are four, okay? And Garrett had two versions, the positive future and then it has this post-apocalyptic. What do you prefer? Nasif? Nice future or ugly future? <laughs> Leonid, do you have a preference? I'd go with nice. Nice oh, future. Yes. I was thinking no about I was hoping you decide nice future. Okay, so we have a preferable. Good future. Okay. And, uh, and how far do you think we're talking about? 20 years from now, 50, 100 years? Depends on whether we want to see through the animal's eyes or we just want to control them and have cameras on their backs. <laughs> uh, since we select for that, I probably I would prefer to, to have that. The whole thing. The whole thing. Uh, 50 to 100 years, somewhere around there. Be, be the animal. Okay, let's be optimistic. Let's say 2007. <laughs> because we also have to fix the planet. Okay, so it's going to take some time. 
Okay, so what was your good scenario, Garrett, for the good future? Um, the setup isn't necessarily required, but that the animals are the hallucinations and they're being controlled by your brain. And it's like Pokemon, it's basically Pokemon Go controlled by brains and with a different narrative. But, um, but there is still definitely room to, control, like we said, control real animals. And if we're going to be seeing through their eyes, then that's what we need. Um, Personally, I would like to control the, the real thing, as it's just simulation. And since we can do it, I would like to be the animal, for example, or something. This would be right. cool. Okay, so let's say the animals are real. Okay, I think we have them. Yeah. Mm. Yes, okay, we have the uh, urban animals. Urban animals. And, uh, okay, so the future is nice. We have these animals and we use them as uh, pieces. And uh, why are we playing this game? Well, I could envisage a couple of scenarios. Uh, one thing would be for research. For instance, if we want to see the world from the point of view of an animal, it might help scientific research, definitely. Or it might be played by people who are very interested in animals, who love animals, and want to know how they feel, and they're curious about their, their way of seeing things, but not in an academic way, in a more uh, personal, out of personal curiosity. Other options? I also see a scenario of like pest control. Like you control a predator and you know, it's fun. You don't even, you pay to do it. Mm -hmm. And you also get rid of pests in an urban environment. Okay. Mm, do you have a preference, the rest of the group or a different option? I kind of like Gareth's idea about the pest control. So. Okay. And I don't think it's exclusive to um, <laughs> Giorgio's idea either about animal lovers. You know, it depends on what animals <laughs> you love. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go for pest control. So what do you get out of it? Is it your job? So you get money for doing it? Is it you get points and then I give you yeah, I was thinking maybe like there could be an environmental aspect to it. So like city restoration, rehabilitation, whatever we want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. It's fun. I mean, you get to be this like big predator and the thrill of it is should be exciting. Um, mm -hmm. The way that I had phrased it was that there's a financial incentive from the company mm -hmm. to make it because people would pay for it. But there could also be sort of a return on that, where you actually pay people to do the pest control. Okay. So let's see some of the topics that maybe we didn't cover. Okay, what happens in the game? Do we have uh, some kind of conflict between those animals or all these animals are in one group and they just go out there and kill animals that are not controlled? We said we have two teams. We can change that, of course, okay? Right, and I think practically it would be difficult to uh, have two teams, one controlling the pests and one controlling the predators, just because we'd have to implant the pests, which would okay. be... Okay, we can have teams controlling uh, different predators. Yeah, that would make sense. Or we can change the, the, the decision about the teams. But let's make some quick decisions so that we can... Because time passes, and we, could, we like to, to have a rounded idea, because we had a lot of things that we've been through, so let's make some decisions. Okay. We could go with more of the animal 
lovers side of things and people pick their favorite predator and as a company we reintroduce those animals into the environment around the area but they're implanted and so they are sometimes co-opted for the game so do we still have pest control or we just uh... right so so it'd be pest control so like you know eagles hunt rabbits so do foxes so do you know, mm -hmm. you keep going down the list of that. You pick whether you're Team Fox or Team Eagle, and then the company reintroduces one of the two, depending on who wins or depending on who has the most players. Okay. So th this could be, for example, what you win from the game. Okay. Okay, so we need to design to define uh, the rules. How do you win? And what you can do? So I guess that each team controls one. it is one per person, so each person has one animal, all right? Okay. And then, what do you do? <laughs> Go out there and kill. Is it a, there is there a shared pool of uh, pests that we hunt? Georgia? Now personally, I was just trying to, to describe what we're saying now with the original title, which of course was just an idea, but um, how does the hallucinate, are we moving away from the hallucination dimension or is it still in the background? Um, because it's, it's becoming something very concrete and not an hallucination anymore. Right. Personally, I had moved away from it and was maybe going to yeah, come yeah. back, but I'm not <laughs> attached to it. So. Okay. Okay. Because I really like that idea. <laughs> it's okay. We move away from it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there could also be a point system of pests where we have uh, based on sort of danger level or um, just amount of in the area. So if there's a lot of rats, it's lower points. And if it, there's like, I don't know, like opossums, then there's less, but they're bigger. I don't know. But some sort of like point system. Okay, so you play for a specific time period. To kill them all, what is the, the ending condition of the game? Gotta kill them yeah, all. I think it would, <laughs> gotta kill them all. That <laughs> is our catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Wins. Okay. So it's competitive. Wins. So I think we have most of the stuff here. Now we need to find a name for this game. Oh, 
okay, it's in 2017, it's a preferable future, we have other players. Okay, we didn't explore the age gap, but it doesn't mind. Maybe we have groups of people of different age. So we didn't exploit this as much. And then we have pest control. And we have this team with the animals and we have to kill them all. What could be a name for this game? <laughs> pest control 2017. So it's like <laughs> Cyberpunk 2077, but pest control. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we have any other options? It could be a meaningless name or something that sounds nice but does not reflect the game more. Maybe we should start uh, evaluating this one and then see if we come up with other ones. Okay, but it would be nice to have a second one, so at least to have yeah, a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, uh, just buying time to, to make a nice <laughs> name. <laughs> okay, let's see. How original do you think it is from 1 to 10? Hmm. <laughs> Not if you, you evaluate the name, the name of the game. So you... you you set all the marks. How original do you think it is? Uh, From one to ten. <laughs> probably around three or four. <laughs> okay, four. How easy? Is it to read? Ten. Ten. Yeah, ten. Okay. And how is it? Is it right? Ten. <laughs> I would say nine, there are three words. So, How nice does it sound? Uh, I don't like pests. The idea of pests, so... <laughs> I don't know. I would give it a two. Okay. But I like the inspiration. The inspiration from, from the book, the game. Okay, how does it sound when you use it in different senses? For example, I'm going to play Pest Control 2070, blah, 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 blah. How do you think would it sound in a sentence? It's a little long. Hmm. I can already see myself trying to find it in future Google by typing in PC 2070 and getting <laughs> something very, very different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, let's give it a five. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is quite easy to remember, especially if you live in 2070. <laughs> so probably it's a nine. It is 100% relevant to the game. <laughs> and is it associated with something positive, well-known, important? Okay. Test control is not a bad thing, but it's not, I don't know, maybe five so we have like 29 39 40 54 okay do we have another one <laughs> uh, we have seven more minutes okay right. okay so maybe we can move on and uh, you have all the documents there so you can also play later if, if you want about it and uh, okay, let's try this one. Why do you think it's so cool? What did you say in one sentence to sell your game? I will write something that you said before. Okay, this is for hardcore players. Maybe something, one sentence for the animal lovers. You could hug them. Sorry, sorry, Georgia. 
Yeah, why is it cool? I think it's because you can experience to be one of the predators and then you gotta kill them all, uh, kill the mm -hmm. all pests. And in a way, you make a better future because the pests are like uh, extinct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you said two things also. Uh... Become the predator. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Be oh, yeah, an so, eagle. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 go. Be an eagle and help your fellow citizens. Okay. I made it a little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have some selling points. Uh, and, and I guess regarding the ethical issues, okay, the idea is that you selected animals that uh, probably it would be rather okay to kill the pests. So this is part of the ethical issue. And since mostly it is, uh, if uh, the humans do not communicate with each other directly, but only through their uh, animals, so probably we do not have many problems there about uh, regarding stealing your thoughts or messing with other people's minds. Because actually we have the humans messing with animals' minds. Yeah. But maybe we can have some problems with the feedback. So we're, I'm not so sure what could, if the animal could actually do something to your brain when you experience the world, for example, as a needle, if the experience might be overwhelming for you. So probably this is somewhere we would need to research and uh, maybe transfer the experience first, I don't know, to a simulator or something and to dump it down and see how, how you can experience, or the experience of killing something. Uh, when you feel that your animal is killing something, I don't know how, what will you reflect to, to yourself. I think pain is also a problem too, right? Like mm -hmm. you are a predator, right? So you're at the top of the food chain, but there's definitely still risk there. Mm -hmm. What happens if your animals hurt? Mm -hmm. Do you feel the pain? What threshold mm -hmm. does it reach? Yeah. Because like you'd want feedback, right? Like that's that's exciting. That's what gives it some thrill. But yeah, maybe, you don't want to like uh, a filtering mechanism that turns right. down the experience regarding resolving. So you feel maybe a little pain in a different scale, or uh, when something is very intense, you make it uh, as intense as uh, you can have. It's like going to the movies instead of seeing the worst thriller. You see something that is a little scary. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think we have to move on. Actually, we did the, the presentation mm -hmm. at the same time as we were discussing it. So before we, we finish, I would really like to hear from you. Uh, what do you think about this workshop, this strange workshop? Because the theme was strange. It's something what we never done before. The topic was quite hard. So what did you think? Do you like to go one by one? And mm -hmm. if you don't want to say something, you can pass. Okay, I will start the way I see you in the camera. Is that Giorgio? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I quite like this activity, actually. I think it was really well organized and you gave us enough theoretical information in the beginning to solve the tasks that we were presented with. So I don't think I have criticism there. Um, the only thing, maybe uh, it would be better to give us more examples of what a game like this could look like at the beginning before we venture into the activity. Because when, when we were filling out the word documents, trying to find out different groups and blah, 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 I was going, I was blanking out a little bit mm -hmm. and I didn't know uh, what kind of a game should I design? Because I was thinking of the experiment that you had mentioned and trying to go off of that. So maybe it would be good to have an example there at the beginning, but apart from that, I thought it was really, really well organized and executed. And I had a good, and I had a wonderful time. Thank you. So if, I, if I had, I would have preferred to explore the hallucination scenario, but it, <laughs> it was fine with that too, yeah. Maybe it's your next paper, you know. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> So, Georgia, for example, if I had uh, one example presentation of a sample game, 
would that help? Uh, yeah, ex or, or even a game that you define in a couple of sentences and you say, yeah, for instance, participants in that workshop have thought of a game about pest control in which you do this and this, just to give you an example. Okay. And in, the, in that way, you don't just have the, the questionnaire that might be a bit open at the beginning. And if you don't have any, if you like me, if you have no idea of what the field is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank Got you. it? Yeah, like Giorgio, I had a great time. I think it was a lot of fun. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, it's very hard to know. And I'm a sort of neuroscience engineering student. So I'm generally pretty limited by how far I think in the future. Um, so that was the fun part for me was kind of unanchoring myself from all the technical concerns uh, and thinking farther out. But in that case, too, having sort of a, a limit on where does this future exist would be interesting. So are we thinking near term? Are we thinking um, farther in the future? Because in this case, we went very far. Um, but we could have gone very, very close. And I think if we wanted to do that and maybe think of something that could be built in the next five to 10 years, having sort of what Giorgio was saying, examples of current brain games um, and even like brain art. So I'm, I've been kind of working in this space. So um, are you thinking of doing another workshop like this in I the future? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, I mean, so well, I thought of this, I have a resource about like brain games and brain art that um, it might be interesting to look over. Um, oh, yes, please. Present. Yes, sir. So, if you wanted to like use some of those resources, I think that would be interesting to kind of give a launching off point. Mm -hmm. So it's this. This is the document you shared. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you scroll down, there's a few like images of things that people have made. Okay. Um, a lot of them are more artsy than game. Uh, and of course, very rooted in the present because you're working with current technologies. There's plenty more theoretical stuff out there about brain games. So that could be interesting as well. Um, just digging a little bit deeper into that beyond the brain to brain interface side of things. Okay. Great. Thanks. Nazir? Okay. Uh, I don't really have not, uh, things to say, but uh, for the suggestion, I think Gerard and Georgia already covered it. And I really had a good time. And yeah. Uh, is it okay if I like rip some of the idea that we talk about into like uh, a games because I usually make um, like mini games with my friends. Mm -hmm. So I think it, like I, sometimes I join like game jam. So maybe I might use the idea for the games. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's all. And yeah, finally, I, you guys can see me. I just bought one of my lab friends webcam. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hi to everyone. <laughs> Learn it. Um, yeah, it was wonderful. I couldn't contribute much because of the all the helicopters right uh, flying above me. If I ever was looking up, that's because there was a lot of noise and I was a little bit spooked. Um, <laughs> so it was wonderful to witness kind of how um, how far you've driven us in terms of ideas. I did not think about including plants, for uh, for example, but it sure would be interesting. You. I, I could think of scenarios of how to include that, and I didn't do that before. It was also interesting how we came back to kind of the same pleasures that uh, we experience in games now, the pleasure of a different subjectivity, the uh, thrill of the hunt, this time with a more murdery uh, twist. Um, and I think it would have been far more interesting with a lot of different teams and in some kind of ideal state where um, Zoom and all these online things wouldn't be quite as limiting, it would be very nice to actually be able to peek at other teams and look at what they're doing and then just kind of push each other in terms of imagination. And if anyone um, of you can um, read German, there is a book that deals with stuff like this. Um, I think it was published in 2014 and it's called New Level and I'm just going to post the 
German Amazon link, just the first thing I found. Uh, it was part of a um, literary festival that also dealt with computer games and they've invited authors to imagine some weird, weird games and they've um, also futuristic stuff, pretty much fantasy. And they've, as far as I remember, came up with a few weird, interesting ideas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you know, thank you very much for your help. Um, you want to say something? <laughs> thank you very much for this workshop. I think it was really fun. It was the first time I participated in this workshop as well. I want to thank you all for being here uh, until the end. It was great having you. Um, um, just to remind you that the workshop, the whole workshop is being recorded. The video will be up in a couple of weeks. If you don't want to be included, just uh, type it in the chat and we'll find a way to, I don't know, blurry move. We'll, we'll see what we'll do. So again, thank you very much all for being here. Thank you, Dimitris, for this workshop. And um, hopefully we'll meet again, maybe. Um, that's all for me. I'm okay. stop, stopping recording. Okay. <laughs>